Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are in Senior English A and we are working with the Beowulf epic poem, the Anglo-Saxon poem. We are in part three. I'm with you on your, uh, in your hymnals on page 6263. The final lines of the poem now we turn to. We just finished with this um, episode where the young warrior Wiglaf stands next to the old fart. Beowulf helps him to defeat the dragon in the process, Beowulf will be mortally wounded. He will ask to see the treasure. Wycliffe will go and find the treasure. He will show it to the king, the dying king. The dying king then makes a couple of requests. One, uh, he turns the kingdom over to uh, Wycliffe. And then secondly, he will say, I want to be remembered by the building of a lighthouse that will set atop a cliff and as the warriors try to sail their boats into the harbor, they can look up, see the lighthouse, Beowulf's barrow. It's sometimes translated, sometimes translated as Beowulf's tower, sometimes translated as simply Beowulf's lighthouse. And they will see the lighthouse and know how to navigate in. In the same way, Beowulf will fundamentally be saying, I lived a life that allowed for Anglo-Saxon warriors to know how to live their life. That is to say, a role model of sorts, we might say. I'm with you now at the bottom of page 62. There's a little bit of Beowulf part three that is not in your hymnal. And so we want to pay attention to this information there at the bottom of page 62 in italicized. Wycliffe denounces, we're told, the warriors who deserted Beowulf the Geats burn their king's body on a funeral pyre and bitterly lament his death. Let's write down the word lament. It simply means to be very sad. There's going to be two or three primary reasons why there will be such sorrow with the passing of Beowulf. We are on page 63 now, and the final section is called The Farewell. Let's now take a look at how the Geats respond to the death of their great warrior Beowulf, King Beowulf. Then, I'm with you again on page 63, the Geats built the tower as Beowulf had asked, strong and tall, so sailors could find it from far and wide. Working for ten long days, they made his monument, sealed his ashes in walls as straight and high as wise and willing hands could raise them. And the riches he and Wiglaf had won from the dragon, rings, necklaces, ancient hammered armor, all the treasure they'd taken were left there too. Silver and jewels buried in the sandy ground, back in the earth again, and forever hidden and useless to men. Now that's interesting. Let's pause at level one and point out that while it's Baal's hope that this treasure will be used by the people, the way they end up doing it is to commemorate Beowulf's memory. That is to say, this treasure is kind of buried with him. Now, this, of course, will lead treasure hunters. You're familiar probably with the famous movie um, character Indiana Jones, who will spend his life, his professional life, uh, going out and looking for hidden treasure. A lot of those kinds of hidden treasure people have often wondered if this is actually true. Is there buried treasure in any number of places? I'll let you Google that question on your own to see some really fascinating stuff. I'm, in, I'm on page 64, line 856 and ending. And then 12 of the bravest Geats rode their horses toward the tower telling their sorrow, telling stories of their dead king and his greatness, his glory, praising him for heroic deeds, for a life as noble as his name. So should all men raise up words for their lords, warm with love when their shield and protector leaves his body behind, sends his soul on high. And so Beowulf's followers rode, mourning their beloved leader, crying that no better king had ever lived... No prince so mild, no man so open to his people, so deserving of praise. Notice the translator's insight at the sidebar on page 64. Mild, in line 868, is not a description of Beowulf as we have seen him, but it is a description often used in the New Testament 
Testament more evidence that Beowulf is not a pagan poem. To be mild here would mean just, so let's write that down. That means Beowulf was a good man, a just man. In lines that are not part of your anthology, Beowulf will actually speak about his life. And about his life, he will say, he tried to always do the right thing. He never committed civil strife. He never killed somebody from his own tribe. Let's finish now some observations about the Beowulf epic and do some annotative work now at level two and three. If we were to ask, what are the major messages and themes of an epic poem like Beowulf? Let's jot down several possibilities. One, this is a story, this is a poem about what it means to be an Anglo-Saxon warrior or fighter, what we will sometimes refer to as the Anglo-Saxon code. That is to say, you have courage, you are very brave, let's write that one down. You are an individual warrior who will, in the face of danger, not run. Wycliffe sees the dragon, along with the other warriors who have been sent along with him to protect Beowulf, and they all run. Wigliffe is the only one who doesn't run. Number two, to be an Anglo-Saxon warrior means that you are honest. You keep your word. If you say you're going to do something, then you actually do it. Both Beowulf and Wigliffe are prime examples of the kind of warrior codes. Okay? Of course, let's just say it out loud, you got to be number three. If you're an Anglo-Saxon warrior, you got to be one B-A-D guy. That is to say, you are great at fighting. You have tremendous strength. Okay? These warriors prided themselves on strength. Notice back to Beowulf part one. Beowulf is, we're told, has the strength of many men in his hands. He is an incredible fighter warrior. But... This is also a poem that speaks about not only being an individual warrior, but as well what it means to be the subject to a king and to be a king to subject. So let's talk about the political ramifications at level 2A. The politics involved. So let's write down a couple of ideas here. One, if you are the subject to a king, you obey. You have humility. You show respect. Remember when Beowulf comes in front of Hrothgar, he shows respect by kneeling. He makes his request not in the form of a demand, but rather as a question, a request. Is it okay if I fight against Grendel? He shows respect. Of course, as well, we pay, we pay close attention to the other side of the coin, the equation running the other way. That is to say, if you are a king, then you have to take care of your subjects, especially through generosity. That is to say, you make sure that your subjects are well taken care of. The king, in other words, is not about himself, but rather about taking care of his subjects. So that is to say, we use this term in an earlier lecture, a symbiotic relationship between subjects and ruler or king. In other words, the king has certain responsibilities to the subject, the subjects have certain responsibilities to the king. They work together, and therefore, there can be peace and harmony. When Beowulf is mentioned as being mild at the end of Beowulf, the epic poem of part three, what really is being suggested here is he is a just and honorable king. In other words, his people lament his passing because he was such an honorable man. He had a good reputation. He lived a life that demanded respect. Let's finish then with some possible messages at the very end of the poem. A couple. One, live your life in such a way that you can be proud of the life that you lived. Two, live your life in such a way that it will be remembered, that others will be proud of the life that you lived. This, of course, will be for us a message that will resonate through time. Right? The idea that an individual then can be taken out from the group, assigned very special kinds of status, and will live that life 
than with honor. Won't take advantage, won't become proud. Remember, that's one of the uh, primary messages from the end of Babel too. Avoid pride. Just because you are a superstar, don't lord it over other people. Just because you're a leader or a king, don't lord it over other people. Don't get too big-headed, we might say. All right, let's pause now and go to 2B. What do we want to say about this poem as a poem? Well, a couple of things. One, obviously this is a poem with all kinds of vivid descriptions. Lots and lots of descriptions. When we go back and we study this poem, we find, for example, that those classic moments, the battles, the descriptions of where the monster, for example, will live in Beowulf 2, the descriptions here in Beowulf 3 at the very end, and the, and, and the uh, lamentation of the passing of the king uh, Beowulf, all of these descriptions are very, very powerful examples of what fine poetry can be and do. Number two, let's point out this is a poem that uses a lot, uh, uh, references a lot of symbolism. We could mention a number of these symbols. The arm of Grendel, for example, is a symbol of lost power by the villain. But the place we'll probably focus on, of course, the most is Beowulf's Lighthouse. Let's write it down one more time. Beowulf's Lighthouse is a symbol, a symbol that represents the life of a great leader. That is to say, a role model of sorts. In the same way that sailors look up to see the light of the lighthouse and know how to navigate, Beowulf's life is a life that can serve as a symbol, a representative model, a lighthouse, a guide, we might want to say for our notes. Beowulf's life can serve as a guide for Anglo-Saxon warriors. Let's jump now to level three. At 3A, we can obviously think of a lot of titles that come to mind that we can relate to the Beowulf poem. What is for you your favorite video game? What is for you your favorite movie that will play the game of a great and mighty fighter or warrior or hero? For some of us, this will be the plethora of films that have been made in the last number of years that are specifically about superheroes, Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, Wonder Woman. All of these share in common that you have an individual who has special powers that could do something really mean and nasty with those powers, but doesn't. Instead, does only good things with those magic powers. Of course, we as well cannot, cannot talk about the Beowulf epic without talking about J.R. Tolkien. He translated much of Beowulf and he will, of course, have written really famous novels. The most famous, of course, are The Hobbit itself, and then that famous three novels that we call the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Later, of course, made by Peter Jackson into films that become really popular. Many have argued that one of the reasons these novels first and then later films were so popular is because they capture a certain kind of understanding of the hero, the hero, the, the, the individual who is a great and mighty warrior, but also, of course, a loving and a gentle and compassionate person. Finally, let's turn now to 3B and personal reflections. We'll ask two questions that you can write down that can be personal in relationship to the Beowulf epic. One, do you consider, personal first, do you consider yourself in any way heroic? Can you write down at least one way in your life you have been somewhat Beowulf-like, or we could say from Beowulf 3, Wycliffe-like? That is to say, can you think of a time in your life when you could have done something really not so good and you chose to do something heroic, something positive? Did you show compassion to another individual who you could have hurt and you didn't? Okay. Were you generous? at some point in your life, and you gave with generosity your time, your energies, or maybe even your resources. And finally, let's ask the communal question. What about heroes in our society that you live in today? We asked earlier the distinction maybe we draw between being a hero and being a celebrity. Do you see those as the same, or do you see those as different? Do we live in a culture and a time that still celebrates heroes? Do we still need heroes? 
Do we still need examples of sacrifice by the, indiv indiv by the individual for the greater good? Do we still believe in those concepts anymore in our culture? And if not, why not? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, there you go. You have some questions on page 65 and following that will help to kind of focus your study and your preparation for the examination. An introduction to Beowulf, the epic poem. Thank you.